Now, I don't know if my camera is going to work or not. Uh, you don't need to see me, but you need to see the uh, the screen share. So I will turn that on and see if you can see it. Let me know. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So we left uh, off in Mark 4. We read through the parable of the sower, and then we started to ask questions about, well, what does this mean? And we had to defer... Uh, discussion on that until we see how Jesus explains what it means and then we can talk about it a, a little bit more when we have a picture of the parable and its interpretation uh, side by side. So he, he begins up here and in verse 3 he says listen uh, and then uh, down in verse 9 then he kind of wraps it up and he says whoever has ears to hear let them hear. Is, it's kind of a call for attention or listening at the start and then at the beginning. Verse 10. When he was alone, the 12, uh, and I, I underline these next words because I had never really noticed them before, uh, and the others around him. There were other disciples in addition to the 12. Now, Luke tells us that, you know, that he sent out 70 or 72 disciples one time. Uh, so we, we know that Jesus had a lot of disciples. A uh, book I was just reading today said, you know, he, he must have had uh, more than 100 disciples. You know, you count those 70 that he sent out, and you count some, you know, there are some additional women, for example, that you know, were not sent out but would have been disciples. And even he would have had, could have had uh, other male disciples that he didn't include in the group of sending out. So he could have easily had a couple of hundred uh, disciples uh, at this time. While he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked about the parables. So he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. And uh, this is one of the most uh, discussed sections of Mark because uh, modern day disciples don't understand what it means. <laughs> it's like, uh, we are, are, you know, we're on the wrong side of this. Uh, he, he's not, he's explaining it to the disciples, but we don't understand the explanation. What's going on here? Uh, and the, the kind of the, the difficult part of this is that Jesus said that uh, the reason he spoke to the people in parables was, in verse 12, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. It's like Jesus did not want people to understand. And uh, the scholars today you know, are always saying, well, you know, Jesus used parables to illustrate, to help explain. Uh, but this is not what Jesus is saying right here. He said that the parables do not explain. The parables hide things instead of explaining them. And then he uses, uh, and then he, this is all a quote from Isaiah 6. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. It's like Jesus did not want them to repent. He did not want them to be forgiven. And, you know, we might say, and all the scholars puzzle over this too, what, what is going on here? Why would this not work? Uh, there are some ideas. Uh, I could talk, you know, mention a couple uh, one is that this word, so that, uh, doesn't really mean for the purpose of, but it might mean with the result. Uh, that even though this wasn't Jesus' purpose, this is what happened anyway. Uh, the problem with that explanation is that the Greek word, so that, almost always means purpose. And all the, you know, the translations on Bible Gateway, all 40 of them. 
uh, all it suggests that there's a purpose involved here. The, the Greek word is tra normally translated as purpose. So Jesus had the purpose of teaching in parables so that not everybody would understand. Well, that's still puzzling. Uh, another suggestion is that Jesus was doing this as a tease. Uh, it's kind of a, a call for attention. He says, this is a mystery. You want to hear a mystery? You want to, you want to hear the secret? And yeah. people will then pay attention. Uh, so that's kind of a rhetorical function. And another, another thing that we might uh, notice here is go back to Isaiah 6 and see where he quoted this from. So I'm going to go back uh, and then uh, share a different version here, Isaiah 6. This is uh, kind of a, starts out with a famous passage from Isaiah. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Uh, but, you know, that, that sounds really great. You know, Isaiah was, you know, stepping up and doing what he says, but then God explains the mission. He says, go and tell the people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, turn and be healed, or as Jesus says, be forgiven. And then I, Isaiah asks, so how long? And he says, until the cities lie ruined without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted. And he's, he's describing this doom. You know, Isaiah might have thought, hey, I, I didn't sign up for this. Uh, here I am, send me, but now, oh, no, now count me out. I don't want to hear this message. I don't want to deliver this kind of message because people don't like it. Uh, but there, there is there's something with Old Testament prophecy that it's not always exactly as it appears. When Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and said, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Uh, was it destroyed in 40 days? No. No, the people repented and the prophecy, uh, in, in one sense of the word, the prophecy was false. Uh, it did not come as uh, predicted. Uh, in 40 days, Nineveh was not destroyed. That's because it's kind of an unspoken part of the prophecy is unless you repent, unless you change your ways, you're going to be destroyed. Now, God's not interested in just destroying left and right. I mean, if he wanted to do that, he could. He doesn't have to warn anybody about it either. But the reason he warns people is so that they can repent. So Jesus, so so here I, Isaiah is, you know, God is telling Isaiah, go and tell his people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Uh, the reason he is telling the people is so that they will change. Uh, and it's maybe there's some reverse psychology involved there. So this is not, you know, hey, hey, you people, you're not getting it. You people are not getting it. And maybe by saying that, it will uh, uh, awake a few people out of their slumber and say, oh, what is it that we're not getting? And they'll think about it. And by doing that, it will you know, just break them out of their complacency, help them take a new look, and be able to change. That might be something that's going on with what Jesus says about parables. Uh, I want to go back to Mark. Uh, so he says, yeah, I'm speaking to these people in parables so that they may be ever seeing and ever perceiving. And so he's kind of, he's giving these parables as a way to peak people's uh, interests to help them think about something in a new way. Uh, because if they don't change their way of thinking, 
if they're just being taught in the same way they have always been taught, then they're going to come to the same conclusions they've always come to. But they need to have different conclusions. So Jesus is teaching them in a different way so that they can uh, maybe come to a different conclusion. I, I'm not positive that's the right explanation for these verses, but that's the one I happen to like best right now. <laughs> uh, do, do, any, do you have any other insights that you might like to share with us? <laughs> but, yeah, no, Mike, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a different style of speech. And a lot of times Jesus have said statements that will evoke strong emotions. And I think, uh, again, being, I guess, being a pastor, you know, I, I not only think of the context when Jesus Christ was speaking to the disciples and a few others, but knowing that this will be written and millions more of people like us will be reading it. So when we read this, it kind of also evokes this emotion. I would say, I don't want to be like those people who uh, by doing and yet they still don't get it. You know, I want to be responsive. I want to be open-minded. That's the kind of uh, emotion or response I, I will have just reading it. So the, the impact of the style <clears throat> affects us even in this generation. Um, you know, I agree. That's that's why I learned that you know years ago when I was going to Asusa Pacific University, they said that quite a few of what Jesus Christ was saying is because a lot of those people have been so ingrained with the old ways, and Christ would say something to shock them, to make them think. You know, uh, like oh, you have to obey all of these commandments before you can be saved. You know, and then. That is to evoke an emotion, but the young rich ruler left when he should have at least, like us, would say, "Whoa, you know, I should. What should I do? You know, Lord, what more can I do?" So that creates more questions and more digging um, and inquiry. Anyways, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it that reminded me of the marks theme of secrecy. He says, you know, don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> As you say, then, then Mark has published it for millions of people to read. Uh, so something a little different going on there. There's a, 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 even though the theme of secrecy is really serving a different purpose now than it was then. Mm -hmm. uh, but Mark keeps telling us, this is a secret that you, the reader, are having privileged information. You know, we we as readers need to appreciate that this is uh, this is something that not everybody knows. Uh, so we maybe that yeah that that's a, well, that can be going on there. Yeah, um, Mike. I yes, was Barb. I was reading the account in Matthew, and it it shows that. Um, it's representing the, the different kinds of hearts. Um, it's it's represent it's the the, for, the soil represents the hearts. It's saying, uh, what is this? Matthew Matthew thirteen. Yeah, that's it. Talking about the parable explained, and it said, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Uh, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then da, 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 da. Now, let me go down a little further. Um, but he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who sees, received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches ch chokes the word. Um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the scripture. I'll just go down. Um, yeah, that's paralleled in Mark a little bit yeah, later. This is in Matthew, but isn't that talking about the soil is the, the condition of the heart? 
Oh yeah. Based based on this particular parable, and based yeah. on Ellen and Mark and Matthew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mike, isn't this like a oxymoron type thing where, you know, you're hearing Jesus say, "Go out." If you can't understand this parable, you're not savable anyways. But on the other hand, he says, "Go out and save everybody." It's like an oxymoron <laughs> type thing. <laughs> is it not? Yeah, there is some element of exaggeration involved. Like in verse 11, he says to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. But they can read earlier in Mark and everything wasn't in parables. Um, yeah, so there's some exaggerations going on. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the soil is the heart and the seed is the word of God. Right based on this parable. Yeah, yeah, we get that. We'll get to that in verse 15. Oh, oh okay. You're just a little ahead of us. <laughs> oh, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, 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 yeah, kind of a puzzle as to why Jesus uh, spoke in this way. There's kind of a, a difference between insider knowledge and outsider knowledge. He was explaining some things to his disciples but and they but the general public didn't necessarily understand it but still thousands of people came to listen to him you know it, it, i don't think they come to listen to somebody who they don't understand anything at all they didn't come to listen to him for farming advice uh let's let's go you know hear the carpenter tell us how to go fishing <laughs> it's there's, there's something there that they understood and liked and appreciated. Uh, Jesus was uh, an attract, not just for healing, but they wanted to hear him teach. People came, people, her perfectly healthy people came. Not, you know, because they wanted to hear what he taught. Uh, it's not just to see a show. Uh, so there's, there's some element there that yeah, Jesus did, was communicating, teaching, something in a way that people could understand. The other things about the kingdom, apparently they did not understand. And these parables were designed in such a way to, uh, you know, if, if people didn't really want to understand this, then they could kind of stop uh, at the parable and say, well, yeah, I understand about farming, but you know, that's, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, but the parable also functioned to provide a springboard or a platform for Jesus to be able to explain something about the kingdom to those people who really wanted to know. In uh, verse, uh, verse 13, uh, Jesus says, don't you understand this parable? Uh, how then will you understand any parable? Like, this parable is the easiest of all. Uh, so if you don't get it, you're not going to get the more difficult ones. Or another possible meaning of this verse might be that this parable is the key to all other parables. That this, this will be the, uh, the entry point for understanding everything else about the kingdom of God. Uh, well... In some ways, it, it's, it, it's interesting, though, that how, how he describes, uh, as Barb was getting into there, that the, these, uh, this parable of the seed and the soils uh, reflects our hearts or people's hearts and whether, whether they are willing to listen. So in, the, in this table, I have put the parable and Jesus' explanation of it uh, kind of side by side. The, the farmer sows the word. So the seed represents the word, uh, the, the teaching, the message of the kingdom. So Jesus says, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, uh, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. It, it just doesn't get in. It doesn't even get started. Uh, the birds eat it before it, it even has a chance to germinate. Verse 16, but other people are like seeds sown on rocky places. They hear the word at once, receive it with joy. Yeah, they like the message. Uh, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. 
Uh, and then Jesus explains what you know, takes them away. Trouble or persecution comes because of the word, because of the message, because of the gospel, uh, because of what Jesus is. They quickly fall away. So, so the seed, uh, I don't know, they, they become, uh, they, they accept, uh, become a disciple of Jesus uh, kind of in a hurry really, without really understanding what it means. But once they understand what it means, then they say, oh, well, I don't want this. I, I never really signed up for this. Uh, they fall away. People could describe it in different ways of falling away. Verse 18, still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But so they, they hear uh, and it starts growing in them. Uh, the seed, it, it, the parable really doesn't say it started growing, but that's kind of implied. Uh, it says, the parable says, the thorns grew up and choked the plants so that the seed had gotten to the plant stage uh, of growing. And so Jesus, then Jesus in verse 19 mentions three different kinds of things. I, I underlined them because I noticed the threes. Mark likes to put things in threes. And so this is, this is one example. The worries of this life, uh, the deceitfulness of wealth, uh, desires for other things come in and choke the word making it unfruitful. So the, the gospel, the, the message of the kingdom can uh, be contrary to these three things that Jesus is mentioning. Uh, people have worries about this life. Uh, the, the, God, the message of the kingdom isn't necessarily going to solve their worries. Uh, it's not going to make them go away. But if people can be distracted by all these worries, then yes, you know, it, it will distract them away from the kingdom. And it's, it's not just wealth that will distract them, but the deceitfulness of wealth. Uh, wealth is deceptive. And you don't have to be wealthy in order to succumb to the deceitfulness of wealth. Uh, you, if you imagine that more money is going to solve your problems, then, then you have been deceived by wealth. And the desires for other things, uh, that, that's kind of a catch-all category. Uh, whatever else you want in life. Uh, the, the gospel of the kingdom is not a way for us to be given all those things that we might want. So there's a, a battle, uh, kind of, you know, struggle for our allegiance in our hearts. Uh, some people will uh, fall away, and they, or, or the word will be unfruitful in them uh, because they go back to the things of this world that the gospel does is not uh, giving them an answer to. Um, and lastly, others are like seeds sown on good soil. They hear, they accept, and they produce a crop, uh, and then three different kinds of crops, 30, 60, some 100 times what was sown. Uh, a very and uh, different fruit uh, of the message in our lives. Uh, Barb was saying, you know, that's, it's like our hearts. In some ways, you know, it's called the, you know, the parable of the sower. Uh, the sower just shows up in verse one. <laughs> it's the sower's is, is, isn't mentioned the rest of it. In some ways, it's, it's a parable of the soils. That's what's different. That's where Jesus is describing the different soils or the different kind of uh, hearts that people have in receiving the word. Any comments from you? Uh, insights you've had? Or <laughs> Barb reading in Matthew to see what Matthew says about it. <laughs> Matthew, and, and I think this parable is in Luke as well. Uh, it's kind of like the, this is a very important parable for understanding the kingdom of God and Jesus' message. Uh, so and Matthew will kind of help explain uh, it in a little different way than Mark did. Chances, 
as far as we can tell, Ma Matthew used Mark as a, as a first draft, and then he added his own material to it. And he would also smooth out some of the places in Mark that he found a little rough. Uh, when Mark makes the disciples look uh, a little too uh, un understanding, so like verse 13 there, don't you understand this parable? Uh, it's, Jesus is kind of chiding them. But then Mark is putting that into a story to help people realize, ah, we are being given clues here that the original disciples didn't have. And there's another thing there, too, is that the disciples were not picked because they were exceptionally smart. They were exceptionally this or that, exceptionally anything. They were ordinary people just like we are. And so if Jesus works with them, you know, uh, approves with them, they had failures, you know, so we, you know, we can identify with people like that because, you know, sometimes we feel uh, as ashamed as Peter did when he was, uh, had betrayed Jesus three times. Uh, we can feel as foolish as, as they did when they were caught in some kind of mistake. And Jesus said, what were you talking about on the way? You know, and, and Jesus knows quite well what they were talking about. <laughs> well, Mike, this is, uh, this is a problem because being an ordinary person like I am, if I don't understand this parable, I'm in trouble. Well, no, that, actually, I, I was kind of uh, I, I thought of that earlier, too. I don't think the scholars understand this parable very well. They, the scholars, you, you can read 10 different books on the parables and get 10 different explanations of what this parable, you know, the new, the, maybe the overall picture is the same, but they'll get differences of opinion on how this uh, happens. And I, as I commented in, in one of my classes in the seminary, it says, you know, scholars don't like to admit it, but we don't understand this parable as well as we'd like to either. Uh, so, yeah, we are uh, in company with the disciples in a way. Uh, we're still learning uh, about what it might mean. And then that, that kind of can lead to a different purpose of parables too, which some of the scholars point out. The parables are designed to get us to think. Well, Barb, you don't have to read more Matthew, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the parables uh, are, can get us to think and get us to discuss this. Uh, and in different situations, we can see different applications. Mark is telling his, uh, his readers uh, in, in a way, uh, look, you, you can go out uh, to the city of Rome and preach your heart out, and lots of people are not going to accept your message. Some of them are going to accept your message for a little while and then stab you in the back later. Uh, but, uh, the parable says, yeah, this is going to happen. This is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what the message is going to do, uh, how is, it is going to be received. So there's a kind of a lesson there uh, for Jesus' ministry, a lesson for those disciples as they went out to preach, a lesson for us today as we go out to preach. People are not necessarily going to understand, uh, not going to understand it the way that we do. Uh, Mike, so there's a variety of receptions. Mike, yeah, yes. Can I comment there? Um, Robert Capon, one of the authors on, regarding the parable, uh, gave a very interesting observation in the sense that most farmers, if they will plant a seed, they will only choose the soil that they have tilled, that they have prepared. And that's where they will put the seed. That's a good soil. But this one, he was indiscriminately the sower, throwing all the seeds everywhere. And uh, Robert Capon, is kind of, in, in his explanation, is saying, for him, the sower is the father. And the seed is the word or Jesus. But by grace, he doesn't like pick only, okay, only the nation of Israel. But, you know, spread throughout 
and you don't really know exactly who may respond because some people out there may respond, some may not. And it kind of, in a ministry sense, like us today, uh, we cannot also say, we cannot say, oh, this person will not listen to my, the gospel, but more of by grace, just keep on, just keep on. It's like the sower, you know, the work of the father spreading the seed and um, ultimately there will be a response. We don't have to worry about, I, will only, I should only plant in this soil that I want. You know, we cannot know, you know, only God knows. And that's, you know, the book of Robert Capon, the parables. Yeah. Another lesson that we might get from this parable too is we could ask ourselves, what kind of soil are we giving the word? Uh, as we, we, we have a choice and how we respond. And whether we are letting trials, tribulations, the cares, the worries distract us away from what uh, the kingdom is. In a way, that the parable isn't so much about the way the kingdom will be. It's not describing the glorious future that we look forward to. Uh, it's describing the way the kingdom is in this age right now when it's, it's a, uh, it is being preached and it is, uh, some describe it as the God's kingdom is invading the kingdoms of this world. And there's kind of a struggle between the good and the bad and we, we have to choose where our allegiance will be. Mike. Yes. Somehow that what Bernie just said about um, the seed being scattered on all soils, rocky, good soil, and that we are to continue to spread, you know, spread the soil regardless and it, not like the farmer who will prepare the soil and only spread the, soil, the seed on the good soil. It, it helps me understand my, what I was gonna ask the question about that next verse, I guess I'm getting a little ahead too, because it's like the next verse in 21, verse 21, where he says, do, do you bring a lamp to put it under a, a bowl or a bed? So in that sense, it seems to be saying, spread the, so it's the seed regardless, let your light shine and whoever it reflects on, it's not up to you the benefit of it or the, the fruit of it or the outcome. It, it helps me understand, well, it helps me sort of put, make sense of it for me. It's because it, it seems like a contradiction if you're first talking about, you know, some will accept it, there'll be rocky soil, uh, there'll be uh, those who just turn away immediately and the good folks are the ones who are the good soil that hear the word, accept it, produce a crop and, you know, and, and multiply it. It seems that my, my struggle would be to be, the, be that good soil. That's my focus, to be that good soil. Uh, but when it talks about, do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl? It's talking about spreading the seed everywhere on the good, we don't determine what the rocky soil is, where the bad soil is, who's going to turn away, or who's going to multiply and immediately receive the seed. Does that make sense? Well, yes, yes, it did. And I'm, I'm glad you noticed that. It, there's, there is kind of a contradiction or a contrast between that, this parable, the parable of the soils, and the next one. You know, earlier Jesus said he was telling teaching people in parables so they wouldn't understand. But then in verse 21, he says, you know, do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Are you, are you hiding things? Do yeah. You normally hide things, but yet it sounded like Jesus was talking about hiding the meaning. And then verse 22, whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. <laughs> whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. So this, this is just 
by two different two contrasts. Is is Jesus' message designed to be hidden, or is it designed to be disclosed? And maybe there's a, a little bit of both there, as he was saying, you know, for those who don't want to understand, it is hidden, so that they are not, uh, whatever, so they, I'm not sure what. <laughs> for those who want to learn more, they can. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what the next, Next parable talks about two, verse 24, consider carefully what you hear. You know, think about it. Uh, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, this was a proverb of the day for, you know, if you go in to buy some grain, uh, you know, the grain merchant would have a measure. Uh, of, of, you know, they'd have scales that balance, and they would have, on one side, they'd have a uh, you know, a lump of metal that was supposed to be, you know, one kilogram. I don't, I don't, I don't know what uh, to weights, uh, their weights and measures were at that time, but we can talk about a kilogram. If they had to cheat, they could, their kilogram could be slightly less than a kilogram, so they didn't have to give you as much wheat. Uh, so the, the parable was that with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If, if you cheat other people, you're going to get cheated yourself. This is you're applying it to uh, consider carefully what you hear, uh, what, you, what, you, what you bring to the message, uh, and then that, what you receive from the message. So what the measure you use, if you receive it with generosity, maybe it will be given to you generously. And even more, uh, this is not a, you know, the rich get richer uh, means, but it, it is a, those who are responsive are in given, uh, entrusted with more of Jesus' message. Those who are willing to do what he says. Who, whoever has will be given more, you know, so if you get a little bit, then Jesus will continue working with you and helping you grow. Whoever does not have, even will be taken from them. And if they don't want to hear more about it, if they opt out, then he is not going to, you know, badger them with uh, things they don't want to hear. Mike, does this have anything to do with uh, talking in tongues? Mm, not that I know of. Because <laughs> they're saying if you're going to sow seeds and throw it out there, and some people, uh, says anyone who has ears to, ears to hear, let them mm. hear. Um, it's kind of like if you don't throw something good out there, they're not going to receive it as good. But I know speaking in tongues, if you can't let everybody hear the same language, it's bad. Is that not correct? That's uh, yeah. Well, that's in in interesting. I haven't heard it in that context before. Uh, so, uh, Paul, uh, that's. Kind of a different subject. Paul said he spoke in tongues. Right. So there's no, nothing is not wrong in itself. But he didn't do it publicly, he said. He, he wasn't trying to, uh, he, he was teaching in tongues. He, you know, if you speak, you're not necessarily teaching. You can praise God. Uh, Paul says you edify yourself. Uh, but other people have difficulty being edified by things they don't understand. That's, uh, and, well, I don't, but I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think the parable is about that. Uh, maybe it's, there are principles there that can be connected. Um, Something to think about, huh? Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, the, the point in this passage here, uh, this section that uh, NIV calls a lamp on a stand, uh, it, it seemed to, uh, it's giving the impression that Jesus wants his message to be known, to be broadcast, to be published, and for as many people as possible to understand it. Uh, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Uh, so there's two parts to that saying. Uh, if anyone has ears to hear, 
that implies that some people do not have ears to hear. So they, they have ears and they can hear the sound, but they're not necessarily understanding the message. But for those who do understand, Jesus says, let them hear, let them listen, let them, you know, uh, let it be effective in their life uh, for whatever the effect uh, is desired to be. So there's a little, again, a contrast between those who are going the wrong way and those who are going the right, right way. Those who are rejecting Jesus as a teacher and those who are accepting him as a teacher. There's any other comments? I think the, um, the second think one, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted to mention the Aramaic is, uh, if one brings a hearing ear for himself, he will hear. So, oh. you know, sometimes people come to hear and they have a, a suspicious heart and, and then there's people who come to hear with an expectant heart. And I think uh, you're coming to hear. I think it's, uh, I don't know if I'm clear. It's an attitude of heart, attitude of mind. Yeah, it's, and people, people do that when they read too. Sometimes we can read, uh, we can read to criticize or we can read to learn. Uh, and some said you know, we should read charitably. Uh, not, uh, we, you can be, critical in a literary sense without being criticizing in terms of saying that it's wrong. You're looking for something wrong, but you can uh, read with understanding uh, and you can analyze it for the good reason or for a bad reason, either one. What I was saying a while ago too is uh, the contrast to conceal or to broadcast. Uh, I think when it comes to the broadcasting or revealing the gospel, when we look at the entirety of the Bible, the entirety of the gospel, a lot of the scriptures are in support of that second one where it's got to be a light, it's got to be spread, which is the gospel, right? I mean, that's, that's more of it. So the other one that says more conceal, I think it's more like, as you mentioned, it could be just to evoke emotion, to evoke questions. But also you mentioned a while ago in Isaiah, where it continued to ask, how long, oh Lord, is this going to happen? There is this element of time, you know. There are certain occasions when Jesus would say, this is not the time yet. You know, not, not the time to reveal. There's a time order for things to really go out. When, when the Hellenistic Jews started to respond, you know, in John, then that was kind of an indication uh, because Christ has to go through and fulfill certain prophecies so that's probably another reason why maybe based on Isaiah, the how long, the, there's a time element before the full kind of revelation uh, to fulfill his timeline. Christ has a kind of a timeline that he follows. Is that a correct assessment? Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, that's, uh, that we, do, we are living in a different time than Jesus was teaching this originally. Uh, he was teaching this before the resurrection, uh, before the, uh, you know, the sending of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Uh, so we, we, we are in a different age. And as you say, most of the New Testament is designed to, to proclaim. I mean, it, most of the New Testament is written to people who are already believers. Uh, the letters of Paul are written to the churches, people who are already believers. Uh, if, you don't, if you write a letter to unbelievers, they're probably not going to read it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the message does get preached to people who are resistant or people who want to twist it for some reason or another. And uh, uh, the, the, kind of the message of this parable is that, well, it, it's just not going to work. We're not going to uh, force you to, to people who are not being called. Hear, hear more, I guess, if you don't want to hear it. Would this have anything to do with 
the Lord coming to you three times and gives up on you? Well, I, I, I have not heard the three times uh, part. Uh, okay. I think that's in the Bible. Uh, I, I think that the Lord may be um, much more persistent <laughs> than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if, if he can uh, work circumstances in your life, to, uh, to get you to wake up, uh, then he, he will continue to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the sower. The sower continues on sowing. I think the skip of spreading the seed, even if he knows that some of this is rocky or soil, but he will keep on. And in time, that heart may change. As there are many people, I mean, I could say like in the early years of the church, my I had a rocky heart. I was suspicious. I was skeptic. And the seed didn't really work. But, but Jesus, you know, to God's spirit was persistent, nonstop sowing the seed in my heart. And then I changed. You know, there's a time element. So God does not quit on us, even if at the start we are rocky, you know, or, or whatever. Is that gracious? You know? Yeah, it's that's true. He never gives up on us. <laughs> and in in a way, yeah, I got that leads to the next parable. <laughs> so um, I, it's a short one. I think we can at least uh, have time to get started on it. The parable of the growing seed. Uh, Matthew won't help you on this one because it's not in Matthew. This is one of the few sections in Mark that isn't in either Matthew or Luke. Uh, it's the only parable that's not in Matthew or Luke. This is what the kingdom of God is like, he said, Jesus says. A man scatters seed in the ground, night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, then the man comes back, puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So it's just, he's describing something that just happens by itself. Uh, this is what the kingdom of God is like, he says. Does that mean we don't have to do anything? We just sit around and do nothing? Just watch? <laughs> well, we don't know how it works, but we're going to watch. <laughs> I don't think that was the point of the parable. <laughs> but the point is that it will happen whether we know how or not. Uh, that God, God is not like a farmer who does nothing. Uh, in fact, uh, most farmers at least do a little bit. They'll go out and pull some weeds, uh, scare the birds off if they can. Uh, you know, that, that farmers, farmers generally work more than 40 hours a week. And back then, they probably worked more than that, too. Uh, and But it, Jesus is just making a comparison. There's not a complete uh, allegory where every detail fits the picture, where God doesn't know how seed sprouts and grows. Uh, no, I don't, you know, Jesus is not talking about that. But he's saying the kingdom of God is like something that happens without us knowing how. It's going to happen. Uh, God sows the seed. All right, some of it, is get, it gets eaten by the bird, but others, uh, birds, others of it grows and produces fruit. We don't have to know how. Uh, we're just involved in God calls us to. But part of the puzzle there is all of these parables about the kingdom, and our puzzle then is to say, okay, how is the kingdom of God like this? <coughs> Whole picture of the kingdom, but at least some aspect of the kingdom of God is like this. Uh, in this case, it's well, it happens by itself without us knowing how. Okay, uh, that might mean that, uh, as as Bermy was commenting earlier, says you know we go, we go out and preach. Uh, we don't know who necessarily who's going to respond. We don't know how to engineer their so social or psychological circumstances so that they will respond 
We can't cultivate in that way. We just have to sow the seed and watch the results. We don't know how, why it affected some people this way and some people that way. Uh, and our changes in our church. We don't know why some people accepted the doctrinal changes and other people didn't. And we got surprises on both sides. We don't know how it works. Uh, that's, it's not in our control. <laughs> Just uh, a personal story uh, for everybody. You know, when we have the change, we had the changes in the church. I was against it. I was one of those skeptic people, and I talked to Mike about it. And I get went, to, you know, somehow we were in Pasadena, and Mike was, you know, a friend of mine who was so patient. He did not lambast. He did not correct, or he did not chastise me. I was obviously wrong. But then when I went back to the Philippines after the conference, Mike kept on, because he's a friend, you know, kind of trusted him. He kept sending materials, kept on, without correcting, without whatever. And then my, my mind changed. It took a few months. Some people, like, you know, there's something that's, and Mike probably doesn't even know it, but he really kept on sowing the seed in some ways. And it changed me in time, you know, in time. So it worked, you know, just uh, so, I, you know, that I, I tell Mike that I thank you, Mike. I say that uh, you've been patient with me. Now we work together. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, thinking about that parable where the grow, uh, the seed, where, you know, the, the farmer doesn't know how it grows. And remember uh, when Nicodemus uh, asked, uh, and Jesus said, uh, uh, how, what, how is it to be born again in spirit? And Jesus said, uh, you, you do not know where the Holy Spirit, you know, it's like the wind. So it just blows and you don't know where it comes from. So something like that, maybe uh, God's grace, God, God's work is everywhere and invisible. But as, as Pastor Bernie said, not forcing was, uh, you know, love is not forced, so it's not forced. Well, we have only two minutes left, so I don't want to go any further. <laughs> We, we could we could start on the, the smallest parable, the parable of the mustard seed. <laughs> but now we'll we'll pick that up next week. Uh, any other any other comments, observations, questions? Well, just uh, just a quick comment. Uh, you know, sometimes as pastor, I pray and I think God. You know, we have this pandemic; people are isolated. There isn't much we can do. We wish we have more time to fellowship and so forth. But this uh, particular parable, the last one, gives us the assurance that God is at work. He, you know, although our work as ministers or members with each other got lessened in a physical way, but the work of the Father has not lessened. He continues to work in each and every one of us in ways we may not even see, but still the work of God, and it will produce fruits. You know, that to me is uh, inspiring, you know, as, as a Christian. Yeah, we trust in him. Yeah. Yeah. It's his kingdom. Oh, that changes everything. <laughs> He's the boss, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, good night, Mike. Thank you. Thanks. All right. We'll see you Sunday next week. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.